going to cover 10 of our most common or top noxious weeds and how to make them less common in your yard. Um, as usual, I, most of these weeds can be controlled with herbicides. I'm not going to go in those, into those details today. Um, so if that's the option that you would like to use for controlling your weeds, please feel free to contact me afterwards. Um, I feel like choosing the proper herbicide is always a very uh, selective process and you need a lot more details than I can give you in this presentation to make the right choice. So um, please uh, don't expect to hear specific herbicides to control these weeds today. Um, so I'm gonna start with the definition of a noxious weed. So noxious weeds are non-native plants that cause ecological and economical damage. They are aggressive. Sometimes they're toxic or poisonous, difficult to manage, highly destructive, competitive for the plants that we do wanna have. Um, and they can often be a carrier host for insects or diseases. We have 154 species on our noxious weed list for Washington state. And thankfully not all of those are present to my knowledge here in Cowlitz County. Uh, though we do have quite a selection here. Um, we should control noxious weeds because they cause that ecological and economical damage. Um, they can reduce forage quality, lower your crop yields, destroy habitats for wildlife. Um, they can clog waterways, decrease your land value, and another assortment of uh, impacts that they have on our environment. Also, it is the state law to control these noxious weeds. Uh, we have RCW 1710, which is written to limit the economic loss and adverse effects to our agricultural and natural and human resources in our state um, due to the presence of noxious weeds. So uh, if you wanna learn more about that, that's um, what we operate based off of. Treating noxious weeds. Uh, noxious weeds are classified into three classes, class A, B, and C. Class A weeds are uh, designated for control in all areas of the state and eradication is the highest priority. Class B weeds, there's about 66 of those species. Um, class B are designated per county. So um, some are designated in our county and some are not. And um, when they are designated, it is required for control. And then class C weeds are a little more widespread. I'll be talking about a lot of class C weeds today. And um, Designation for control is determined at the county level for those weeds. Um, and the idea behind class C weeds is to limit their spread versus completely eradicate them. So um, when I talk about class A, B, or C weeds, which I'm mostly gonna be talking about B and C weeds today, uh, that's what I mean. So when we look at noxious weed control, um, it's very important to use an integrated pest management approach. I know many of you have probably seen this slide before, but um, looking at the combination of biological, cultural, herbicide, and mechanical control methods uh, to uh, control the noxious weeds. So taking more than one approach using all of the tools in the toolbox uh, is often the most effective method. So you may need to combine some of these methods um, to get the weeds under control. So we'll be talking a little bit about uh, which methods are effective for the weeds. Um, and then I'm gonna, I got asked recently by one of our fellow master gardeners, if this was in your yard, what would you do? So I'm going to give you that answer for these weeds. What would I do if it was in my yard? So um, what are our top 10 most common noxious weeds? Uh, you may recognize some of the photos here on this slide, but uh, I'm gonna carry on starting with tansy. So tansy ragwort is one of our most common noxious weeds. Many of you have dealt with this in the past. Um, it's a class B noxious weed, a taprooted biennial plant. It can be, become a perennial plant if you mow it or continuously cut it. Um, but for the most part, it is a biennial plant. So you'll see the rosette the first year and the second year uh, it will bolt and then flower. It does reproduce by seed, not by rhizomes. Um, and it is toxic to cattle, horses, other livestock, except for goats, goats can tolerate it. Um, you may recognize it with these bright yellow, almost orangish flowers. They have uh, many disc flowers in the center and only 13 ray flowers on that, on each flower head. Um, it grows anywhere from, I've seen it anywhere from two to six feet tall. And uh, the plants produce about 150 seeds per plant. So preventing this from going to seed is very important. And those seeds are viable in the soil for roughly 16 years. 
Um, and they tend to germinate after a disturbance in the soil has happened and those seeds are brought to the surface as they need light to germinate. So uh, I'm not gonna talk a little bit anymore about the identification of tansy, but uh, here's some photos of it. In terms of controlling this, uh, there are many options that can be effective. Um, biologically, a lot of people do see the cinnabar moth around. Uh, I actually saw one that had completely devastated, or a population of cinnabar moths that had completely devastated a few plants. Um, so they are still around and can still be effective. Uh, there's also two other biological control agents for tansy, uh, the ragwort flea beetle and the ragwort seed fly. Um, we typically don't do a lot of releases on tansy, especially with uh, biological controls. What you'll see is uh, an increase in the population of the weed, followed by an increase of population of the biological control agent. And that can happen over many years. So there's typically um, a period of time where those seeds are really highly produced because the bug population hasn't caught up yet. So unless it's an unavoidable circumstance, we tend to not use um, biologicals as the main source of control for tansy. Um, probably the best thing that you can do is prevent it from seeding, uh, cutting those flower heads off and disposing of them in the trash. Uh, typically you don't recognize that you have a tansy infestation until it's flowering. Other than that, if you know you have an infestation, um, digging out those rosettes uh, can be effective as long as you get the entire root um, and then cutting and bagging it at the appropriate time. Like I said, repetitive mowing can prevent the plants from going to seed. However, um, it may just turn the plants into perennial plants and they could come back next year. So it's not my favorite method. There are a number of herbicides available um, that can be effective on tansy. Um, the best time to treat it is in the fall when they are smaller rosettes. Uh, if you miss your fall treatment or you want to do a follow-up in the spring, uh, spring is also a great time before the plants uh, develop their flowers. Once the plants have flowered, I would not recommend spraying it with min most of the herbicides. Um, and the plants have enough resources in their uh, system to still produce seeds for up to two weeks after the plant has been sprayed. And so what we find a lot of the time is people say, oh yeah, I sprayed my tansy while it was flowering and then it still produces seeds that are viable. So um, we tend to, once it's flowering, always recommend cutting those plants. So if this were in my backyard, uh, I would first look for the plants in the rosette stage. That's that very small picture um, of the plants on the left. When they're small like that, you're using far less herbicide or you may even be able to dig them up at that point, depending on how many you have and how large your infestation is. Um, but from the time that it is a small seedling like this, you have about two years to before it flowers. So you've got some time on that one. Um, it gets The rosette gets a little bit bigger through the following year. And then the second year it will bolt and grow you know, a, a flowering stock. Um, at that point, you could still either dig that up or spray it. And then once the plant has flowered, if you did miss any through any of those methods, you would definitely want to either pull or cut that plant and bag the uh, flower heads and put those in the trash so that they don't continue to spread seed on site. So if you had tansy ragwort, that's what I would do. All right, Himalayan blackberry. This one is extremely common throughout our entire county. Um, we really have a hard time getting this one under control because it is so widespread. It is an evergreen perennial plant and it reproduces both by seed and vegetatively. So if you have experienced blackberry in your backyard before, um, you may have noticed it may grow up and over things. And then when the uh, vine tip reaches down to the ground again, it can reroot. So it can spread that way as well. Um, so blackberry is very invasive. Uh, it tends to spread and grow over other plants. Uh, it's got this very distinct um, palmate shaped leaflets with uh, five leaves in the whole, leaflets in the whole leaf. Um, it's very spiny stems. Often the stems uh, harden up and turn a bit red. Um, and then of course, these very delicious blackberries. Um, we all love those, right? So how would you get rid of blackberries? Um, a lot of people who have access to goats find success in allowing the goats to graze the blackberry. 
However, if you do that, you would also want to follow up with other methods of control um, so that those blackberry seeds don't just continue to sprout in that area. Um, prescribed burning can be effective for above ground vegetation, uh, but it does not kill the roots. So if that is a method that you would like to follow, obviously not while we're in a burn ban, um, and obviously with some other precautionary measures in place, but uh, it does not kill the roots, so it would only rid your area of the vegetation and you would need to follow up with another method as well. Um, mechanically digging up the plants and removing the roots can be effective, as well as uh, removing and disposing of the stems and roots if you were to physically remove the plants so that they don't reroot on site. There are a variety of herbicides to treat blackberry. Um, typically, Timing wise, the late summer or early fall is the best time to treat. At that point, uh, the plants are preparing to uh, overwinter and taking most of the energy back into their root system versus uh, putting their energy into flowering and creating berries. So the fall is the best time to treat blackberry with herbicides um, if that's the method that you'd like to use. So how would I do this? And actually I, I kind of did do this in my backyard. Um, First, I would recommend enjoying those blackberries one last time before you get rid of them. Um, the more that you pick, the less that is available for the birds to spread and the more blackberry pies you get. But in all seriousness, uh, once the berries are done and have, are starting to fall off the plant, um, I would recommend cutting those plants back to the ground and removing the canes from the site. If you have a, a relatively small infestation, um, this would be more feasible. Uh, if you have a very large infestation, you might skip this step, but it's kind of up to you and how much manual labor you're willing to put in. I will say that the plants are a lot easier to remove from the site when they're fresh and green than when you've sprayed them and let them harden and die. At that point, they're kind of just dry poking sticks that you'll trip over and curse at yourself for <laughs> not getting rid of them sooner if, if it's in an area you're trying to use. Um, after you've cut those down, I would at the base, I would say wait about two to three weeks for the plants to grow back and they probably will. Um, and at that point, you could spray it with a systemic herbicide. Um, so that would be probably the September timeframe. And that will reduce the amount of spray that you're using overall because you're only spraying what's grown in the last two weeks versus what's grown up and over all of your other vegetation. Um, and then monitor the area and consider replanting it. Um, just think of how many birds have sat on those blackberry vines and left other seeds for you, uh, whatever's blown in from neighboring infestations of something else and gotten stuck underneath the blackberries, it's all waiting underneath the blackberry bushes for some sunlight to germinate. So I would definitely consider either monitoring, replanting, covering it with um, some sort of a landscape fabric and mulch or doing something to that area um, before other things have a chance to establish. So it does sound like a lot of work, um, but it is something that is feasible if you're willing to put that work in. All right, knotweeds is the next one I want to talk about. Um, so knotweeds are a very, very aggressive perennial uh, plant. They spread primarily by rhizome and fragmentation, so plants being broken off and redeposited in other areas. Um, that happens a lot along stream banks. So there are four species of knotweed that we look at or that we have in our county. And um, I'm gonna quickly review those. So these are the four species, Japanese knotweed, uh, Himalayan knotweed, Bohemian knotweed, and giant knotweed. So Japanese knotweed is the, um, I'd like to say the smallest of the main species here. Uh, they have these relatively heart-shaped leaves. Um, the stems are hollow. Uh, it's got white panicle flowers that come up from the top. Uh, the Japanese knotweed tends to get a roughly six feet tall, um, and it will grow in a very dense patch, which you can see here um, in the bottom photo, which this one's along the riverbank. They tend to appreciate wet areas. However, I've seen them growing in drier areas as well. Um, this is giant knotweed, so the leaves are significantly larger. Uh, the plants can grow over 12 feet in height. The flowers are also white panicles, but when you look at the length of the flowers in relation to uh, the leaf size, the flower panicles are significantly a significantly smaller ratio. So maybe they're one third or less the length of the flower, the leaves. Whereas with Japanese knotweed, um, the flower panicles are about the same 
length as the leaf. Um, this one, it, like I said, it grows much taller. The leaves are much larger. You can see um, one of those leaves is about the height of a car window in this photo. Um, so we do have this in our county um, in a couple of locations. And then Bohemian knotweed is a cross between Japanese and giant knotweed. So the characteristics on this are more variable, um, but generally speaking, it will grow somewhere between six and 12 feet. Um, and the flower panicles are about half the length of the leaf. So that's kind of the general rule of thumb. Like I said, because it is a cross, sometimes it exhibits uh, some characteristics of giant more so than Japanese or vice versa. So these are all very similar plants. Um, Himalayan knotweed is the most different of the three. It has uh, more slender leaves. Uh, when you see it flowering, you can tell that it, it has the same flower as the other knotweed species. And um, it tends to grow in a similar fashion. They all have a bamboo-like stem that are hollow and um, they're just very aggressive when they tend to take over. So how would you control knotweed? Do not cut this plant. And I, I can't stress that enough. Um, cutting knotweed actually encourages its growth and makes it come back even more aggressively. So please don't cut this. Um, I know many of us are not supportive of herbicides and now is not the time to be the hero with knotweed. Um, there is some theories that grubbing out the infestations can be effective, um, but you have to make sure to get all of the roots, all of the rhizomes, or it will continue to come back. Um, like I said, those rhizomes can regenerate, the fragments can regenerate if they're left on the ground. Um, so I don't know if that would mean just completely trashing your entire soil system there and re-putting something else in, but it would be very Probably tough to get rid of this mechanically. Um, some people have had success um, by cutting it and covering it with a fabric um, and then going back every two weeks and stomping down the infestation. Um, however, they, what I've, the research I've done on this says that you would need to do that every week or two for about seven years um, to mechanically control the knotweed in that fashion. Um, on the biological control front, there is some good news. Uh, we do have a knotweed uh, psyllid that is available for, um, for release. We have did, I think, one release here in Cowlitz County this year as a trial, um, but we think that it's going to be the most successful on giant knotweed. So uh, that's where our infestation of, um, or our population of knotweed psyllids are going is on a, an infestation of giant knotweed. Um, we are hoping that that will significantly reduce the population in that area. Um, this bug was only approved about two years ago, so it's not widely distributed, but if it does well, um, it does only feed on knotweed, so that's um, a benefit. So anyhow, stay tuned on that front. Um, and then I do think that providing some native competition, especially once you've uh, done some treatments on your knotweed, um, can help to shade out the knotweed. It tends to grow in sunnier areas. Not that it won't grow in shade, but uh, it tends to grow in the shadier areas. So if you can plant some small trees um, or things to help outcompete it, um, that can be very helpful in um, eliminating the knotweed infestation. But uh, the primary methods of control are to either do a foliar spray or a stem injection with herbicides. Um, these would be the most effective methods for the amount of work that you could put into this. So if I had not weed in my backyard, I would not cut it. I would enjoy the flowers all the way through about August. And at the end of August, I would either do a full year spray treatment or an injection gun treatment. And we do have injection guns available for loan in our program. Um, and then monitor and follow up as needed. And also, you know, try to plant something uh, to shade it out. Um, on the planting note, if you were to plan on uh, doing a foliar spray, I would probably wait until the infestation is small enough that you can reduce uh, your herbicide exposure to your uh, intentional plantings so that you're not killing the things that you planted. Um, so just something to keep in mind, it might be a couple years down the road um, to get this under control. So 
not weed, very tough species. Um, it's, it's a, not my favorite, but it is everywhere here in Cowlitz County. So we're trying to get that one under control. Canada thistle. Um, this one is also a rhizomatic perennial, quickly invades um, areas and outcompetes other plants, and it reduces crop yields. It spreads um, both by seed and by underground rhizomes. So keep that in mind as we're doing treatments. Um, it's got the purplish to pink flower heads here, usually mini flower heads on the end of the stem. Um, pretty slender, uh, prickly leaves. They're um, definitely lobed. You can kind of see that here in the small picture. Um, so if you have Canada thistle, there are a variety of options for controlling this. Um, on the biological control front, we have the stem gall fly that is available. Um, it basically creates a, um, a gall within the stem and prevents the resources from getting up to flower. There are some insects, nematodes, and apparently the American goldfinch even will snack on the Canada thistle. Um, but research has shown that those uh, insects and animals do a, only a little bit of damage and they don't overall provide control. Um, I didn't put this on the slide, but I've also seen um, in our county a Canada thistle rust, which um, it's like a pathogen type um, biological control that I've seen on the lower side of the leaves for Canada thistle when it's young. And those plants looked a lot less healthy than the plants that did not have it. So um, I'm gonna do some more research on that one, but I, I have seen it in our county. Um, with Canada thistle providing some competitive crops like alfalfa or forage grasses uh, may help to outcompete the Canada thistle along with other measures of control. Um, and then also just maintaining healthy pastures with proper fertilization and things like that can help. On the mechanical side of things, um, repeated mowing, especially in the late spring can help to weaken the stems, but it doesn't completely control the plants. And then um, repeated tilling at seven to 28 day intervals can eventually deplete the resources of the roots. So if that's something that um, you have the resources to do, it may be a very effective way of controlling Canada thistle. Um, otherwise, we do have several foliar sprays that are um, able to control Canada thistle. If you're doing treatments in the spring, you would need to do it before or during the bud stage, but not once it's beginning to flower. And then you can also do fall treatments uh, as long as it's before the frost. So if I had this in my backyard, I would first prevent it from flowering, whether that means mowing it or um, somehow cutting it before those flowers develop. Um, and then I would probably spray this one in the fall or the spring or both, because that would help to get to those underground rhizomes and actually kill the roots and not um, allow them to grow back. And then I would continue by planting some desirable vegetation and monitoring the area uh, to prevent any new thistles from coming back. That's what I would do if I had Canada thistle. All right, so bull thistle. Um, this one is a taprooted biennial. It forms very dense thickets, outcompeting native vegetation. And it also only spreads by seed, not underground rhizome. So this one compared to Canada thistle, bull thistle, I think is a little bit more manageable um, because it's only going to live for two years and it only spreads by seed, not underground. So that, that's one of my favorite things about this bull thistle. Um, it's tends to be a lot thicker and uh, hairier than the other thistles. Um, you can see in the flower picture here, it has a, a large bulb underneath uh, the purple flowers. And so that's um, one of the biggest distinctions for bull thistle. The thistle is the... Uh... Okay, so what will we do to control uh, this? Um, there is a seed head gall fly that can reduce the seed production of bull thistle. And also grazing may be effective um, as long as it's done before the seeds start to develop. Bull thistle is fairly shade intolerant. So if you were to plant some tall grasses or other uh, native vegetation that are shade producing, um, if you had a large infestation, you may be able to shade that out and prevent other bull thistles from germinating. It tends to germinate after disturbance. So if you can reduce the disturbance in the area, um, that can also help reduce uh, seeds from germinating. 
and maintaining healthy pastures. That's kind of a, I guess, a catch all <laughs> answer, but um, continuing making sure you have fertilizer and things like that on your pasture. Uh, in terms of mechanical control, because this is a biennial, it would be very easy to dig this one out um, or to cut it down right before it flowers, and that would essentially kill the plant and prevent it from flowering. If you cut or mow it too early, uh, it could still uh, allow the plant to produce flowers. So kind of wait until most of those flower heads are, are developed but not yet flowering, and that might be um, the best time to cut it down. So um, you could use herbicides on this because it has a, a rosette stage. You could do that in the fall or you could treat it in the spring before it bolts. Um, as long as it's before it's flowering, again, the herbicides should be effective on that. Um, so if I had bull thistle, what would I do? I would try to dig those rosettes up at the very earliest stage, or you could spray them. Um, at the bolting stage, I would cut it right before it begins to flower. Um, or you could spray it at that point as well. Um, if it is flowering, I would cut that plant down and trash those flower heads. Do not leave them out in the garden. And then I would monitor and plant some desirable vegetation to try and shade out any other seedlings that might be in the area. All right, wild carrot. So this is another very common one in our county. It is a taprooted herb. Uh, typically, it can be an annual or a short-lived perennial, so often considered a biennial, you know, one of those plants that likes to confuse us, um, but it does only reproduce by seed. So uh, preventing those flowers from producing seed is probably uh, one of the top strategies for control here. Um, you'll see in these photos, uh, the leaves look very much like carrot leaves. The entire plant is covered in some coarse, stiff hairs, and uh, this species tends to outcompete natives. If you have cows, it can taint their milk and it's mildly toxic to livestock. Um, when it says mildly toxic, I think they would have to ingest a very large amount for it to have any impacts on them, but uh, why, why risk it, right? So uh, it, I think I didn't describe the flower, but it's for those of you who can't see, it's got a very white uh, umbrella shaped flower and um, they're very small flowers make up a huge um, umble shape. The plant grows maybe two to four feet tall. Um, typically that's the tallest I've seen it. And it's everywhere, so look out for it. <laughs> um, biologically, there are not uh, biological controls available for this because it is too closely related to the commercial carrot. Um, any of those biological controls would also attack that, so we can't have that in our industry. Uh, maintaining healthy pastures and native competition can help to keep Kenneth, Ken, or sorry, keep wild carrot out. Um, hand pulling or mowing this when the plants are young can be a very effective method, especially if you don't have very much um, hand pulling. If you have quite a bit, maybe mowing it might be a better option, um, but basically preventing it from going to seed. Frequent cultivation will promote seed germination. So if you're cultivating, you may notice that more seeds germinate. But if you do this frequently enough, you can exhaust the seed bank and uh, also destroy the plants at the same time. So it should help to get rid of it. And there are a couple of foliar sprays available. Um, you can spray them in the fall to the rosettes or in the spring before bolting. Um, the herbicides that we typically recommend for wild carrot are not your everyday run-of-the-mill herbicides. So I would recommend contacting us or if you're not in Cowlitz County, your local weed board um, to get some advice on that. So if I had this in my yard, um, I would try to hand pull it or mow it while it's young in the seedling stage. Uh, if it had bolted and I found it, I would either mow it probably repetitively to keep it from flowering or spray it. And if it had flowered in my yard, I would be removing this, the flower heads to prevent seeding. So also uh, I'd like to point out this photo right here of the white flower in this picture. You'll notice if you ever look at um, a wild carrot, the very center of the flower will have, um, of the flower head will have one little purple, dark purple flower in the center. I, I feel like that's a pretty unique characteristic. So look out for that, it's kind of fun to find. All right, the next one I wanna talk about is oxidaisy. Um, oxidaisy 
is a perennial herb and it is very shallow, shallowly rooted with uh, rhizomes and adventitious roots. So it spreads underground more so than it does by seed. Um, it has many small disc flowers in the center that are yellow and uh, a lot of white ray flowers appearing like petals. So um, typically this one grows, you know, one to three feet tall. Um, it tends to take over pastures more than anything, but I have seen it, you know, intentionally planted in landscapes as well. So keep an eye out for this one. Um, there are no biological control agents available for oxide AZ. Um, if you can maintain healthy pastures and native competition, it can help keep it away. But once it establishes in an area, like I said, it spreads underground, so it tends to spread pretty quickly um, if it's not controlled. If you mow it at um, when it first flowers, you can reduce the seed production significantly but it tends to stimulate the shoot growth. So mowing it um, would not be effective on its own. Um, you could intensively cultivate uh, this plant and it would help to destroy the root system. So, you know, frequently, maybe every couple of weeks uh, going out there and cultivating the soil um, would deplete its resources. And then there are some foliar sprays uh, available for this. I think similar to wild carrot, they're not our typical uh, everyday herbicides, but um, there are some available. So contact your local weed control board if that's the option you would like to pursue. Um, so if I had oxide easy, I would try to treat this at the seedling or rosette stage um, very early on. You could spray it at that point. Um, if you were to dig up all the roots, you might be able to, but like I said, those roots will tend to be um, spreading underground. So you would need to remove all of them. Um, if it was just beginning to flower, I would cut it and follow up with a spray. Um, or I would cut it before flowering and then cultivate if I was able to. So that's what I would do. English ivy. So this one is very widespread in our area. Um, pretty much the whole west side of our state has a lot of English ivy. It is an evergreen perennial vine. Um, it spreads both vegetatively through stem growth and also by seed when the plants are a little bit older. And those stem and root fragments, if they're left in the soil, can re-sprout. So keep that in mind um, as you're developing a treatment plan for this. So there are not any biological control agents available for English ivy. Um, that would be a really nice uh, biological control agent to have since we have so much of it, but um, there's not any available at this time. If you were to, um, you could hand pull this plant or dig it. Uh, it's recommended to do that when the soil is moist. If the plant is climbing trees, the best way to um, kill that plant is to cut it at about wa waist or chest height, um, taking care not to damage the tree trunk, but cut it at about waist height, uh, pull everything lower away from the tree, and then everything up above will eventually die. It will not continue to grow. Um, but you would want to remove everything on the ground and uh, remove it from the site to prevent it from rerooting. Uh, you could cover the area after removing it in a sheet mulch um, and then continue to monitor. Also um, planting some native vegetation like uh, I, think, I think of ferns when I think of replanting after pulling ivy because they tend to grow in similar environments, um, but other native species as well to just provide some competition. And I think that monitoring is an absolute if you are removing English ivy, because uh, you could have missed a lot of little shoots that may re-sprout in the soil. So um, continue to monitor for a couple of years after removing the ivy. Um, supposedly, you can burn these plants with a blowtorch repeatedly, but this does not kill the roots. So um, you shouldn't be doing this during a burn ban, obviously. Um, but if you were to repeatedly torch it, it may eventually deplete its resources. There are some foliar sprays available um, to treat English ivy. It has a very waxy leaf, so we typically recommend adding a surfactant that can help to burn through um, that waxy layer on the leaf. And then you can also do a cut stem application with English ivy, which um, if you were cutting um, 
the larger stems, it's probably more effective on the larger stems, um, but you could do a cut stem application as well. Also, it is recommended if you are handling English ivy that you wear gloves. Um, there are some toxins in the sap that some people have a sensitive reaction to. So if you have sensitive skin, especially wear gloves, but if you just wanna also be cautious, I would recommend that. All right, so if I had English ivy, what would I do? Um, first, I would cut it out of um, any of the trees that it's climbing to prevent um, any further destruction on the trees. Um, I would remove the vegetation mat uh, below the trees and then work my way away from that. And then following removal, sheet mulching, replanting and monitoring. That's how I would remove it if, if I were to be doing this. Okay, field bindweed. I'm sure that there are many of you who have this. Um, it is very common in our area. It is a perennial herb and once established, they say it's nearly impossible to eradicate and I think I can vouch for that. Um, it, it reproduces from roots, rhizomes, stem fragments and by seed. So it's just always there. Um, but you can see some pictures here. There are two uh, species of bindweed that we're really seeing in our area, field bindweed, which is this one, and it's significantly smaller. I would say that the flowers are about an inch in diameter. Um, and then we have hedge bindweed, which is a little bit larger. Um, some people call that one morning glory. And the flowers on that are about three inches in diameter. So we have both species present in our county, um, but I'm talking about the smaller field bindweed right now. Um, so uh, how would you get rid of field bindweed? There is a bindweed gall mite that can stunt the plant growth and reduce flowering. Um, I don't know how widely distributed it is in our county, but it is available. Um, you can try to shade out the bindweed um, or increase the moisture. It tends to grow in drier soils. And in my yard, I've even noticed that as soon as that drought hit us, that's when all my bindweeds started sprouting. It didn't seem to be there in the spring, but it sure came out once those soils dried up. So um, maybe increasing the moisture in the areas that you have this growing. Um, and then increasing either sod forming grasses, bunch grasses, or legumes may be able to help smother out the plants. Um, mechanical control, when I looked this one up, it said not a good option. Um, when you pull those, those roots and leave the roots in the soil, the roots will re-sprout. Um, cutting it can just continue to spread those stems, which again can re-sprout. So generally speaking, mechanical control is not the best option for field bindweed unless you are also following up with another method. Um, I have done a lot of mechanical control underneath a small set of my trees that are uh, very shady. So after about two years, I've seen um, very little bindweed coming back under there. But like I said, it was mechanical removal in combination with trying to shade it out and moisture it out. So. Um, it's not a good option on its own to hand pull it. Uh, yet there are some foliar sprays available for this plant. Um, there were quite a few of them on my, on my list and the timing definitely varied by herbicide. Um, some of them had a spring timing, some of them were fall, some of them were even midsummer. So uh, depending on when you're trying to control this, uh, there may be various options available. So what would I do? First, I would prevent it from seeding, whether that be removing the flowers or pulling those plants that are flowering, um, knowing that it's gonna grow back. I, I think that spraying would be the next best option um, in addition to trying to shade it out or trying to change the environment to a less preferable um, environment for bindweed. So that's what I would do in my yard. I'm currently trying it, battling it with many of you. So let me know if you find any other success methods. <laughs> I'd be happy to hear about those. Um, but this is what I have found to be somewhat successful so far. But again, as I said, it's nearly impossible to eradicate once established. So we may be in for the long haul on this one. And scotch broom. Uh, scotch broom, many of us are familiar with as well. It is a perennial shrub that reproduces by seed. Uh, you may notice that it aggressively forms monocultures and the seeds are toxic to livestock and horses. Um, it has those bright yellow flowers that we typically see flowering in May. Um, the plants can live for a number of years, maybe eight to 10 years they can live. The first three years of their life, they typically don't flower. I say typically, but you know, 
if they have the right conditions, they may flower before their third year. So um, the scotch broom plants have very small leaves. Um, you can kind of see one, that in one of these pictures. But uh, what you see in this photo here is one of the seed pods, which is uh, bright green. As the summer goes on, they dry up and turn a brown color. And then eventually they pop open and distribute those seeds, you know, 15 to 20 feet from the host plant. So um, the seeds are viable for roughly 30 to 80 years. I know that's a wide range, um, but it depends on the conditions in which they're stored. Um, and they are just a very aggressive plant. So. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that one. So how would you control this? Um, there are a couple of biological control agents and some of those have been released here as well. Um, but there's a scotch broom seed weevil and the scotch broom brucid that are both um, available for control of scotch broom. Uh, typically they tend to reduce the number of seeds produced by the plant versus um, controlling the vegetation itself. Uh, but that can help in the long run. So it's being used in some areas um, as the primary control method. Um, reducing soil disturbance and increasing native competition can really help uh, to outcompete the scotch broom. And then um, hand pulling small infestations can be very effective. Uh, we do have weed wrenches available for borrow in our program uh, to help pull out some of the larger plants. Uh, the root system on scotch broom is very extensive, can run very deep. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, if you have a small infestation, hand pulling it may be effective. Uh, some people do um, a mowing or cutting method, uh, especially for larger plants uh, with a diameter of two inches or more. If you cut those in the middle of a drought, um, it's very unlikely that the plant will come back. So uh, unfortunately, that is typically after the plant has already seeded for that year, but you can't always um, get to the plants before that um, under various situations. So uh, cutting those plants at, if they're two inches in diameter or larger can be effective. And then there are some other, or some options for using herbicides. Uh, you could do a foliar spray, which I think a lot of people have a little trouble with because um, you have to coat the whole plant is what we have found. Um, if you miss a branch or miss, you know, a little piece of it, um, that part might still grow. So um, foliar spray is an option if you are coating it well. Uh, a basil bark treatment is pretty effective with scotch broom, and that's when you just um, cut a little bit of a, make a little hack mark at the bottom of the stem and insert some herbicide directly to that. Um, and then cutting, doing a cut stem treatment where you completely cut the plant down um, at the base and then apply an herbicide as well. Um, the herbicides vary based on the method that you're using and what is allowed, uh, but if you need some advice on that, contact your local noxious weed control board. So um, what would I do? Ideally, I would try to control the plants before they're three years old because at that point uh, they may have not produced any seeds or flowers yet. Um, pulling the seedlings can be very effective. Um, the root system isn't as well developed at that point, so it's feasible for small infestations. Um, also with small infestations, um, doing a, a cutting with the larger plants or doing a cut stem treatment can be very effective. Um, if you have a very large infestation, you might consider brush hogging and um, following that up with an herbicide treatment immediately after brush hogging it. Um, you can, again, get some volunteers together like we have in this photo um, and try to make a big impact in a larger area. Um, but whichever method you choose, do monitor the area for new plants. Like I said, those seeds are viable for 30 years and they love disturbance. Um, and you may need to repeat some of these steps for uh, a number of years before your infestation is fully under control. And then uh, try to plant some competitive plants, um, hopefully not invasive plants, but just competitive natives to help shade out the areas for the scotch broom to not germinate. So. One, so it must All right, um, the, that was my 10th plant. Uh, I see there's a couple things going on in the chat. Let me see if there's any questions that I can, um, can answer here. 